uh, for instance, we were the first production in Missouri to film at President Ulysses Granite State. And so that's based in St. Louis. And so this is the first production to do that. And so what you saw was all of it, like the, the actual, the plantation, all those things, was realistically how it was, you know, built back then. And they kind of reserved it. So the mansion being like green, even it being like kind of off-putting, because we're kind of just used to seeing like big white mansions being like the plantation and stuff in movies, that really wasn't reality. They saw the world how we saw it. You know, everything was colorful. Everything was just like, um, I mean, it was fucking bad times, of course, but I'm just saying like, you know, just, just the experience of just like how the earth is, you know, wasn't these grayed out tones and things like that that you see in movies. And so uh, when we're on the plantation, of course, you know, you kind of feel the spirit of the time, you know, during the Civil War, President Ulysses, you know, he was like the guy who led the Union through the Civil War and things like that. Um, um, I'm sure Ezekiel, so you could probably talk a little bit about, you know, you, you, I mean, you came out from Kansas City to play a slave. Um, so. Yeah, I, <laughs> I wasn't a big part of it. You probably saw me for like two seconds in the movie, but um, I just saw that she posted it, uh, so I came out, I drove three hours, and I came for two days to play an extra, and I, I still loved it. I still wanted to be a part of the movie. Seeing the movie now on the big screen, like, the first, like, five, I was like, wow, this is, like, crazy that this is actually, like, shot here, and, like, we made this, and we have to be a part of it. And, like, everything, like, coming together, I was so amazed, but still, overall, like, I, yeah, I, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's one of those things, I mean, again, like, you know, we don't have, like, obviously, you know, it's not, you know, big budgets or anything like that, so, uh, you know, there wasn't, like, extra acting, you know, coaching or whatever. So, so, yeah, so there wasn't like extra acting coaches or anything like that on set. So, you know, I really, you know, I really gave our actors and like their crew like a lot of freedom to really explore uh, what was possible and do a lot of research because ultimately when you're doing a film like this, there's a lot of research involved, not just in the futuristic aspects, but the historical aspects, historical aspects of what was slavery like in Missouri compared to like Louisiana. It's drastically different. Um, and, you know, Missouri was like, I believe, the second to last, if not the last state, to uh, give up, you know, slavery, <laughs> which is kind of crazy when you think about it. And so some of that permeates throughout our reality today, some of that's very much felt. So, of course, white actors, black, black actors on set, in each, you know, uh, area, of course, we all kind of went through that process of, oh, now we're here, I have to say this, I have to be this, and... Yeah, of course it was tough, but uh, again, you just, you do it to be uh, a truthful to the story that's being told. Can you talk about, like, uh, when you, how long it took you uh, coming up with the idea and then developing the story with the three, uh, especially with the different timelines and bringing that all together? So. Yeah, I think one of the amazing things that I'm really fascinated by uh, just in history is what the timeline actually is, and who tells and who controls those narratives. And so uh, what we wanted to do in, uh, uh, in underneath was create multiple outcomes so that, uh, you know, whoever is in a particular timeline, you know, they can con kind of control their destiny, but they kind of can't. Um, I'm, I'm really fascinated by this idea of fate and destiny. I mean, I grew up in a church and stuff like that, so, you know, that, you know, that, that, that kind of, you know, that kind of thing is very fascinating to me. It took me about, I started in 2018, it started off as like this really, like, Star Wars ripoff, and then, like, <laughs> and then this, like, evolved into, like, something a little bit more truthful, and, uh, as you know, as I, as I dove deeper into, you know, researching myself, I dove, you know, deeper into the possibilities of how original the story could be. And uh, so from 2018 all the way through the edit, you know, we took it to New York Film Academy, Carnegie Hall, and even then I was still editing the film. So it really wasn't until two or three weeks ago where I was just like, all right, cool. Uh, we had a, you know, a big premiere out in St. Louis where we had, you know, we had a live orchestra, you know, we had models who were, you know, wearing the costumes and stuff like that from the characters in the film. You know, it was just excellence across the board, black excellence at that. Mm -hmm. You know, we just wanted to put people in the experience of the film. And so, uh, you know, so what's, what's that? What's that, six years now? So, wow. you know, right now we're just looking for distribution and we're just touring it around. So, yeah. And I, I understand I, so you have a prequel. I guess there's more to the story because you have a prequel comic on the way? <laughs> yeah, we do. So I'm in the middle of, like, working with Concrete Comics. 
to uh, create a comic book based on some of the characters. Yeah, I'm really excited about that. Mm -hmm. That was fun. Yeah. 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 It was just amazing. How many films have you done before this? This is my first feature, so yeah, this is my first one. Uh, well, how many films have you done? It's Wissy Asher, brother. I know, I know. <laughs> the feature is a big deal. So let's see. Uh, I did about five or six short films that put out to the public, and then and I've done other, you know, like, I'm sure, like you know, like small gigs here and there at Washington University. Did a you know, mini documentary about Ferguson. Which is what I, you know, that's where I'm from. About you know, it's the birthplace of the Black Lives Matter movement. So you know, that's kind of that kind of defined my voice. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I would say about five or six officially that have been put out. On Which board. one got you the trip to Netflix? Dang, bro, well, that's a very <laughs> specific question. <laughs> that was Static Shock. So I don't know if you I heard about that, but uh, Static Shock was. Comic book character in the early 2000s who just really redefined what you know a representation in black animation and comic books actually are. You know to see a dark skinned brother with dreads who has these electricity powers and whatnot. Of course, electricity is in the film. You know you see some of that inspi inspiration. Um, uh, uh, that that kind of went viral, and so you know Netflix kind of flew me out just to show the and a few other people like who part production to show the film there. So yeah, we just it just exposed me to another level. Like this was possible. I didn't have any manager, or anything like that. I just knew like you know, we, we created something fucking dope, and like just the right eyeball saw it, and next thing I know, I was I was just there. How many views did they have on YouTube? Four million. Wow. <laughs> uh, as far as um, the genre of like black sci-fi or yeah. Or futurism, uh, is that something you want to keep expanding on and yeah. uh, deepening as far as your film creating, or is that kind of uh, is this kind of one thing you've been doing with different types of things? No, I think the definition of Afrofuturism is is extremely broad. So uh, I think when we think about it, I think we think about it in the terms that there has to be like sci-fi elements, and there has to be like laser swords and things like that. And I don't really think about it in those terms. I think about it in a sense that. Uh, you're controlling a particular narrative where there is no cap on what you can do in the confines of what you're creating. And so that's how I think about it. So uh, I'm, I'm working on a TV series right now called Gonzo, which is, I came across the statistic that was, man, let me know if I'm rambling too much, but. No, no, no. <laughs> no. Go ahead. <laughs> you're just rambling talented. I don't like listening. But it's, you know, I, I, I came I across the statistic that was like, uh, you know, only 4% of black people are in the tech industry. That really shocked me because, you know, you know, you know us, man. Like we're on social media. You know, we're influencers. You know, we shape culture, music. We're on all these platforms, but we're not the brains behind a lot of it. And so, um, uh, and that's for a lot of reasons. Obviously, access. You know, access to resources, access to capital, access to education. You know, growing up in Ferguson, having a fucking coding class was the last thing that was. <laughs> last thing that was like on the fucking pole of things. But, you know, people who do create these things in Silicon Valley, who are multi billionaires and millionaires and whatnot, have her, have, had early access to, 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 this, uh, to technology, to computers. Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, all these people. And so I was like, I want to control, I want to make that shit cool. And so Afrofuturism to me is, you know, controlling the narrative, exposure in spaces that we quite haven't seen before. Like seeing black people in the sand dunes, seeing people in the Rocky Mountains where, you know, black people don't normally, you know, are, are tourists at. You know, those kinds of things. That to me is what Afrofuturism is really about. Being in a space that should be normal and natural, but just because of how society has been set up and historically how we have been beat down and pressed and oppressed and saying this is this is the little box that you can work in and you know you know my cousins and stuff can't you know can't think outside of you know the neighborhood and you know things like that because of systematic oppression. And so I think this film uh, especially does quite a bit of a big job at that. You know, Adriana, I know we went to uh, uh, what was it? We went to Garden of the Gods in Illinois. I'll, could, I'll let Adriana talk a little bit. I've been talking quite a bit. Is that cool? Yeah, yeah. A little bit about your experience there. Huh? Uh, it's oh, no, it, was, it, was, it was great. It was wonderful. Um, I had, like, kind of a small-ish part, but, um, yeah, it was, like, fun. Yeah. Um, not, like, as much of a hiker as I feel like it should be, but <laughs> it wasn't even that much of a hike anyway. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, it was, it was really... It was very hot, you know. It was <laughs> hot, and that's what I like. I don't even remember yeah. when it was. Wasn't it feels like in the middle of the summer? Yeah, well, 
And so uh, it was about 50 days of production overall, 50 total days of actual physical production. And Washington University helped quite a bit with just, you know, they brought me in as the, you know, the, the artist in residence, so I had like a salary, which was fucking great. That's an artist. That you get like a little, you know, you get a salary, I was able to get my first apartment and totally quit it, you know, in the middle of COVID. Uh, and then you have like, you know, a little budget. So we were able to bring people in, reimburse people for gas, and people from LA, Atlanta, things like that. Anyway, um, uh, uh, us going to Garden of the Gods, you know, in, in, in Illinois, being the backdrop of like Brazil, that to me was like, this is right here in our backyard. It's mm -hmm. only an hour and a half drive out from St. Louis. So we have all these incredible locations, taking the cast and crew physically, physically being these locations. And there's only like two or three shots that are green screen in the entire film, only two or three. Everything else is real. Yeah. Everything else is like real location yeah. stuff. And that's, so, that's something that I wanted to yeah. add to. Like, this is only my second time seeing the film, yeah. and I feel like watching it the second time, it feels big budget. Like, it just <laughs> the budget, the budget may have not been like super. Yeah, 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 yeah of course. Yeah, it yeah. just feels big like to us. Location. Yeah, big, big to us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. big to people who invested. It. <laughs> it just felt like. Yeah. I have a question for you. Um, looking at, I absolutely love, love it. I love the passion, but you also encompass like historical sites like the Ho Cahokia Mound site, yes. which is pre, you know, you think about it, pre Columbian yeah. Native American site that's historical yeah. from that perspective. And seeing that you also took from, you know, from the futuristic, but you also encompass that historical yeah. passion of it. Yes. How, where did the spark come from? Where did that spark come from? I've always been like a huge history buff. <laughs> so a lot of the inspiration for this film and a lot of the lore came from Sumerian history, which is, you know, the oldest, you know, at least what we can currently trace, is the oldest civilization that, uh, you know, that had cuneiform, that had writings, you know, the Rosetta Stone, and that had all these certain kind of gods like Enki, for instance, who is represented in this film, who is, the, this is a little nugget, so you can see it from a particular lens how I see it, mm -hmm. is like Enki, the god Enki, Sumerian god, is a god of water, fresh water, and a god of wisdom, for instance. And water throughout our film is used quite a bit, and like how it's used in religion, how it's used in faith, how it's used in, you know, like, you know, like a baptismal kind of thing. Um, and it kind of goes back to this idea of just, what the title of the film, everything goes back to the title of the film. Underneath Children of the Sun. Children of the Sun who, you know, you know, black people and slave people who are out there in the fields during slavery. You know, in a scorching sun, there are gifts and talents that we all have within each other. You know what I'm saying? That we just tap into. You know what I'm saying? Of course, it's going to be a renewal process. It's going to be, you know, a conscious decision that you have to make. In the three timelines, you see there are slaves who stay. There are slaves who go. Right? And so I'll just kind of say that. But also, uh, in regard to Cahokia, Cahokia Mound is only 45 minutes out from the city of St. Louis. And it is, at the time of its peak in the early 1400s, it was larger than London mm -hmm. in regard to population. And this was a civilization, Native American civilization, that was the center of trade. You can go there right now and you can visit Cahokia Mounds where they have a museum there. You know, they have the Great Mound. It looks like it looks like fucking Egypt, but with just like grass. <laughs> and it's it's pretty incredible. It's like a, it's a very spiritual experience. And I was very interested in that, in how you have a great city that holds fifty thousand plus people at its peak, and all of a sudden it just doesn't exist. You know. And so I just wanted to, you know, I live so close to it. I just wanted to pay homage to. I have one more question. Did I see that you were uh, directing and being a cameraman at the same time? Or yeah. did someone, you did both yeah. of those at the yeah, same I, time? Yeah, directed, edited, I made the music. Mm -hmm. Wow. I yeah. you. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All because of him, though. He, he kind of pushed me to make the music, honestly. Cause I was, I was going to give it to some other guy. Well, it was like, ten thousand dollars, and I was like, "Wait a minute!" <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you can do it yourself. And so.
<laughs> but that's good, though. But that's what happens when you're under pressure yeah. and when someone believes in you and you believe in yourself. Like, he found a way to get it done. It, I always knew he was a talented guy. He grew up in the church playing uh, instruments. So he's, he's naturally gifted in that space. As you can see, he's naturally gifted in general. But in this space of music, he's really a, a, a gifted person. So I knew he could play the guitar, the, the, uh, the keyboards. He, he's good at all that stuff. So he put that music together, and here we are. And it's out on um, Apple right now. So if you want to go oh, yeah, score, download score the score, Apple's drive home the night and listen to it, it's on yeah. Apple right now. Yeah. 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 That's incredible, man. There you go. Any, anything else? I know we gotta probably wrap up. I have, I have so many friends in Africa. Are you gonna show this there? I hope so. Um, uh, you know the the chair of the Black Studies Department at WashU, uh, uh, Dr. Shanti Pariku, has been like very supportive of this. I think she's going to Africa this summer. Yeah, she's going this summer. Yeah, she's going this summer. And she does work in Uganda. We gotta talk a little bit about it. Possibly going to Africa. So <laughs> fingers crossed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Fingers crossed. But obviously, again, you know, like, again, this was this was made this was made without any infrastructural support. You know what I'm saying? This was made because you know a lot of us came together. We really believed in it. You know, I remember talking to Adriana. I think I talked to you like a year or two before production even happened. You know, and just like, oh, it's, you know, and and to you know to actors and everybody that you get involved. You know, it's just one of those elusive things that you kind of. You don't really know if it's going to happen until you're physically there. And so I'm glad that uh, over the years we were just kind of able to make it happen. And so this was, this was honestly lightning in a bottle. Nobody got hurt. <laughs> nobody fell off a cliff. <laughs> you know, uh, nobody uh, suffocated from too much sand being in their lungs. Uh, you know, a lot of things could have went awry, but, you know, we just, uh, you know, we were blessed to just make this a possibility. I'll say this, uh, you see what David can do on a budget of this magnitude. Imagine if he had a budget, a Netflix budget. I'm trying to tell you this guy is amazing. So if anybody in here has any relationship with anybody at any big company, let us know. We'd be more than happy to talk. About 1.30? Yeah. When was like 1.30. But it wasn't like set. It was one of those things you pay as you go. Yeah, like, uh, <laughs> hey, Jason, I need 10 more grand. I need 20 more. I need Half of my salary went to it. Yep. I was evicted for this shit. Then I had to pay. You know what I'm saying? Like, you just you just pay as you go, you know? All yeah. worth it. All worth it. Huh? Yeah, it was like the tail, like the tail 2021. So summer 2021, I think, like, everything was starting to really open back up for real. But even then, like, people were still wearing masks pretty, pretty widespread, so. But by late 2021, I don't think nobody was, you know, everybody had their shots and stuff by then. So. Well, we're going to have to wrap this up. I want, David, another round of applause.